2022, I think uh, the pandemic has kind of loosened their, its grip on our daily lives, but at the same time, we're also living with the lingering consequences of it when it comes to deepening inequalities at national and international level, but also many different aspects of access to health and uh, jobs, etc. Earlier in the year, we read from a new IPCC report that revealed that the window of opportunity to avoid irreversible harm as a consequence of climate change really is rapidly closing. Uh, just last week, uh, UN Secretary General uh, um, Gutierrez warned us that humanity is on a highway to climate hell and that the fight for a little planet will be won or lost in this decade. So we really do have little time. Um, stakeholders are meeting at Chalmers sake as we speak um, to agree on new and hopefully ambitious set of actions to reduce emissions and avoid the worst consequences. Um, in the meantime, a number of escalating conflicts as well as natural disasters, which perhaps should no longer be called natural, whatever that word even means anymore, have triggered a new population displacement and refugee flows. We witnessed the U.S. withdrawal of Afghanistan earlier in the year. Armed conflicts are continuing in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Ethiopia, and Somalia. And we also have escalating instability in Pakistan, in Myanmar, in Nigeria, and also in the Sahel region. And of course, the events in February, which Russia and where Russia launched a, a military operation. Um, of Ukrainian territory sparking fear of war in the minds of many people who felt it far away for decades. decades. In reaction to this, we have seen member states rapidly expanding their military budgets. A trend that has been mirrored by the EU was also established ambitious plans to strengthen its defense capabilities via the strategic compacts and other policies that we'll have an opportunity to explore more in detail in our final day of the program. In the face of this combining crisis, we find the European Union that is confronted more than ever by its internal contradictions and intensified political contestation over his, its history, its foundational principles, and its future direction. This study tour will focus precisely on how this uh, contestation uh, is happening and manifested in these three different areas, climate, militarism, and migration. And we are delighted to be joined by three fantastic speakers. They will help us navigate some of these big ideas, but also give us some initial food for thought and input um, as we're talking in very broad terms, of course. Well, I introduce them. Stu uh, is a trade unionist. I think many people here know Jude Kijanali from before, as she used to sit as Peace Program Assistant at my desk a few years ago. Um, she's a trade unionist now, currently uh, Deputy General Secretary of Industrial Europe, a platform representing 7 million workers in the manufacturing, mining and energy sectors. Uh, she also served as an MND for two consecutive terms, ending her service in 2020 as a consequence of Brexit. Thank you for joining us. Then we have Claire Deli, is a member of the European Parliament, representing the Independent for Change in Ireland and sitting at the left of GUE NGO. She is a member of the Libyan Committee, the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and is the Vice Chair of the Delegation for Relations with Afghanistan, and active in other, other committees, I believe, trade, security, and so And then Jeremy Lester, finally, he's a former uh, European Union official. In that capacity, he worked on development and human rights in Africa and the former Soviet Union, before being the European Union's Ambassador and <coughs> Chair. He was at times responsible for European relations with uh, several European countries, African countries, apologies, and advised the Africa Department of the European External Action Service on Conflict Prevention. He is currently the chair of the board of Safer World Europe and has just concluded his term uh, as QCI's clerk. So this is a nice full circle moment and a fruitful celebration of this service for QCI. Um, well, I will sit down to start the conversation and uh, throw the first question to all our speakers. Um, maybe not a conclusive answer because it's a really massive question. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, I think. Um, what it's worth saying is that, um, as you said in your introduction, maybe I stand, maybe we should stand up so we can is that better so we can uh, see each other. But as you said in your introduction, 
Um, this is um, an incredibly turbulent time um, in terms of uh, European history more broadly. And, um, and certainly um, it's the single most complicated probably period that the European Union as a cooperation of states working together um, voluntarily uh, to, to find common solutions to common problems. Well, I guess what I was, where I was starting from is that this is um, really an unprecedented period um, in European history in terms of the period, the existence of the European Union. This is the period in which the European Union and the um, unity of the European Union is being tested um, to, in every direction. And that's because we have multiple crises which are mutually reinforcing, playing out at exactly the same time. So um, in one way, we have a, a large scale, and this is my analysis rather than um, uh, necessarily just in line with the three priorities of the of the study tour, but we have on the one side an extremely deep social crisis in Europe, in which as a result of the austerity policies um, which were put in place at the financial crisis, we see societies which are extremely um, fragile, fragilized, I don't know if that's an English word, but kind of fragmented, a lot of precarious work, increasing in-work poverty, extremely high levels of poverty, um, and, and a cost of living crisis, uh, which was already there before the um, invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, but an extremely deep social crisis. We have then an energy crisis, which is, was already there before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but has been intensified dramatically as a result of the invasion, with now levels of energy poverty and, um, and challenges, uh, systemic challenges actually for our whole energy system um, in terms of security of supply, questions in many European countries about whether um, uh, the lights can stay on, whether we have to start rationing uh, electricity, start rationing power, who gets power, who loses power, big social questions as a result of the energy crisis. Um, and that has then, and that's my day job, is has a massive implication in terms of uh, the economy in Europe, because we have large parts of the economy which are not able to function effectively because of the energy crisis. Large, part, large parts of industry which are uh, closed or um, <coughs> are um, effectively um, reduced in terms of production, which means large numbers of workers who normally would be in well-paid, secure jobs, who are then adding to the number of people who are in social precarity, increasing the social crisis. At the same time, those industries are undergoing an enormous transition as a result of the third crisis, which is the climate crisis which is intensifying the energy crisis, the industrial crisis, and the social crisis. So we have these three, this triple crisis, which we already had before Russia invaded Ukraine. But what we've seen as a result of um, the invasion, and then Europe's response to the invasion, has been an enormous intensification of all three crises. And these crises challenge the very unity of the European Union. Because as the European Union, 27 countries that have voluntarily come together to try and find common solutions to common problems, these are questions which rip to the core of society, which challenge solidarity in society, and fundamentally they challenge solidarity across the European Union. And therefore, actually, this is, I think, a, a really unprecedented situation. And, um, and to be uh, slightly positive, because that's all very gloomy, um, but, um, you know, in general, my glass is half full. Um, to be slightly positive, what has been extremely impressive is the unity of the European Union in the face of these three crises. 
which I think very few people predicted would be possible. It was expected, you'll remember the small event of Brexit. Um, lots of the Brexiteers said, we are the first domino, that we will bring down this whole house of cards, the European Union will collapse, other countries will follow us. Mm -hmm. I can tell you in Brussels, uh, the view is, is that the Brexit experiment is definitely not one to be replicated by any other country. And in fact, a lot of Eurosceptic political parties have changed their manifestos and constitutions to talk about reform inside the European Union rather than withdrawal from the European Union because of how badly they perceive Brexit to have happened. But uh, maybe as a provocative start, I would say that actually the European Union has shown an enormous strength in finding ways <coughs> to find common solutions to the crises. The challenge, and this is a, a the real uh, tough one, is the negotiation between 27 member states, between the European Parliament, 750 MEPs, and the Council of Ministers, the 27 <coughs> national governments, and the European Commission. All of that negotiation takes time. And these crises are rapid moving crises, very deep crises. And the danger for the European Union is that it moves too slowly in a very rapid moving context. And that for me is the, the fundamental challenge. But I haven't touched on all of the points um, that you raised. And I think there are questions, uh, very big questions about the militarization of the European Union in this context as a result of the, um, the invasion um, of Ukraine. And maybe when you talk about solidarity, solidarity with who and by who, what has been exposed in sharp contrast is how quickly we were, we opened our homes, our hearts, our borders to those fleeing war in Ukraine. And the absolutely enormous contrast when you think that there are thousands of people sleeping on the streets of Brussels because the asylum system in Belgium has collapsed and they're not perceived to be the same kinds of refugees, <coughs> the same kinds of asylum system. So there are lots of contradictions. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but if you look at the big picture, the unity and the fact that the whole system hasn't collapsed and uh, collapsed into this enormous crisis, I think is something which is important to bear in mind. Thank you, Julia. I suppose the question, what's the political direction of the European Union and how has it strayed, I suppose, from, it, from its uh, foundational principles and so on? I suppose to me where I started is where you finished. I mean, at the moment, the political direction is one of a massive accelerated militarization, which I don't think is a sea change. I think that process was there already. The Russians are even more than gave the excuse for that to be absolutely now ratcheted up and it is totally on steroids now on every single um, budget line, every single meeting is mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, diverting expenditure in the direction of some sort of militarism, be it transport, agriculture, everything is in the light being tapered to the war machine, which to me is incredibly uh, dangerous. It's not what we were led to believe the European was. We were supposed to have no more war in Europe, peace and so on. Now, to be honest, that was a bit of a um, pipe dream in some ways, that if you like, the, the, the peace and equality bit was all a soft law, whereas the role of, of brute economics and neoliberal economics in particular was very much embedded in the hearts of the treaties. But fundamental rights and peace and enforce certainly in the hearts and minds of people put out as one of the sort of great achievements or desires of having a European Union. And now we have war in Europe like that we haven't seen since, since World War II. And the response has been one to arm, to sanction, and to ratchet up and escalate the conflict, which to me is demonstrating that the political direction of the European Union is to be less independent, is to be more Atlanticist, to more follow the US rather than carve an independent role for itself, which I think is very regrettable, to be honest, because Europe could have played an incredibly good role in trying to de-escalate the conflict and trying to uh, talk and organise more for peace. It's the people of Europe who are suffering primarily particularly those, of course, in Ukraine and Russia, but after that, the people in uh, Europe as well. So uh, I think that's been a total wasted opportunity. I think tragically as well, 
the war has been used to abandon climate goals. We now see a move away. Fossil fuels are being rebrought now in Europe. It's not supposed to happen. A lot of the goals set forward were going to be import filthy fracked gas from the US. Terminals are being built now to see filthy fracked gas arriving on our shores in five years' time, which is just, uh, for, from a planet point of view, incredibly worrying. And I think uh, Jim dealt very comprehensively with the social crisis, so I won't deal uh, with that. So yeah. to me, accelerated militarism, uh, mm. ratcheting up the conflict and abandoning climate goals are the uh, Essentially, as well as financially. But I'd like to turn to Xavier, who invited me to speak particularly about the international aspects. I turn to uh, Borrell, Joseph Borrell, mm -hmm. the current High Representative of, if you like, the External Relations Chief. He talked recently about the European Union as a garden, and out there as a jungle. But you, metaphors are dangerous things, you can play with them in different ways. One of the ways of dealing with a jungle is to build a wall to keep it out. And that is one of the ways that the European Union considers. He didn't talk very much about what we do in the garden. That would be interesting. And he didn't say very much either about all those people out in the jungle who might like to make the jungle a little bit more garden-like. So, um, I draw attention to this metaphor because it's, it's a current one, but it needs a lot of untangling mm -hmm. to see what the role of the European Union in the world should be. Definitely, and, and it's very fitting because he was addressing uh, the, a new school for diplomats, future diplomats, so that also ties into what, what is the new generation of EU representatives going to look like? We, we, we don't know, and it doesn't look like it. <laughs> They're getting good, uh, good models for the kind of leadership and diplomacy we need. Well, I suppose from my point of view, it comes from the fact that I was elected from a neutral country. So we are militarily neutral and we very much pride ourselves on our neutrality. We think it's been a great assist to us. It's been a a great assist to other countries as well to stay neutral in periods of conflict is a, is a great protection. So that's something that we would espouse to. And traditionally in all of the treaties of the European Union, there would be huge votes of opposition in Ireland as a result of the growing militarism, which is embedded in a lot of the treaties, probably and mainly the, the Lisbon Treaty, which I think our, our last commissioner referred to as PESCO being the sleeping beauty of the Lisbon Treaty. So all of these military alliances and arrangements have been in place gradually over the past decades of treaties and treaties. It was never supposed to be like that when the project started. We were never supposed to have a high representative or to steer into that area, but it has morphed under the direction, I would say, of the military industrial complex who are clearly embedded in this city in terms of lobbying and so on have steered a lot of those treaties over the years. So they have been there. You know that in the last budget, the last multi-annual financial framework for the first time ever, there was direct expenditure on defence coming from the, directly from the European budget and the European Defence Fund. We saw the European um, Peace Facility, which used to be the African Peace Facility, which used to have a great idea where by as it was a peace facility, the money couldn't be used for arms. But now it's called a European peace facility. And actually, they can spend money on arms. So you're giving money to Africa to buy <coughs> European arms to come back and use to destabilize their countries. And then, as the lads were saying, when the people seek refuge on the borders of Europe, then it's often the very same companies who are benefiting from the border contracts of the walls to keep them out or uh, whatever. So that has very much been the direction that's been ongoing. Since the war started, um, there's been a massive escalation of that. And, and to me, what the alternative should have been, I think we were at a stage where maybe in the weeks beforehand, Germany and, and France in particular were trying to argue or keep in a bit of a space open. There was a little bit towards dialogue at that stage. Obviously, once the invasion happened, those doors were, were shut. Um, but I think the decision to arm and sanction, it's never been done before. Like, throwing arms into a conflict, 
is not what you do. You should be de-escalating. And who has ever argued for arms to go to Palestine, for example, or the people of Yemen? Because there hasn't been any scenario before that I've heard of for people. I never heard them saying, go in and arm the people of Iraq, for example, let them take on the Americans. So putting arms into a conflict doesn't work. It's an alternative to that has to be diplomacy and dialogue. That's what's put forward in international law. That's what's put forward in the UN Charter. And I find it quite incredible that it's seen as a radical and an appalling idea now, when it's the ideas that were always put forward in any other conflict. What do you do in a war? Well, the first thing to do was look for a ceasefire and stop the slaughter so people can sit down and negotiate a settlement. That makes sense to me. Anything else is just massacring ordinary people. And the fact that the European Union hasn't gone down that road, I think, is deeply regrettable. Uh, deeply regrettable. They too now have, have blood on their hands from that situation. They could have played a, a much more positive role, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, Russia bears responsibility for the war. We haven't been shy about saying that, but to ignore the role of NATO and the US in ratcheting this up, in orchestrating and destabilizing the Ukraine would be naive in the extreme. Yeah, I, I guess um, well, we've, we've kind of gone into quite a, uh, obviously a controversial part of, uh, of the debate, but I guess coming back to um, where I started in this, um, uh, this triple crisis, uh, there's a choice for us now in the European Union, as, um, as European Union um, um, member states, there's a question, and and to be fair, not just the European Union, but the wider European community kind of um, continent, um, and Britain as part of that as well. <clears throat> There's a, a route which is about stronger cooperation and reinforcing uh, the roots of cooperation and thinking about what institutions and what measures are needed to reinforce the fragilities in the European Union. And there's a route which is um, advocated by those who are um, of a diff different political perspective than me, but those who um, advocate for renationalization, um, a withdrawal from each other, uh, a focus back on national institutions. And um, when you have the title and you know, this, this, after, this evening is about Europe at the crossroads. That seems to me to be one of the crossroads, like on a question mm -hmm. of energy, yes. uh, for example, which is fundamental existential question in Europe today. There is no European country which is self-sufficient in energy at the moment. We're all importing and exporting uh, to each other at different times and basically, all of Europe now is importing from the outside world. We're extremely heavily dependent on energy imports. So there's a question about how you tackle such an enormous crisis as the energy crisis as a single member state, or whether we need to be thinking about new forms of cooperation, strengthening cooperation, creating new institutions to, in order to, um, to tackle the crisis. And part of the, um, the challenge is, uh, is that I think that demands a, a radical rethink about democracy inside the European mm -hmm. Union. What we have seen in the pandemic, and I don't know whether Claire would agree with me on this, is that what happened during the pandemic, because of the impact of, of you know, people having to make decisions very quickly, um, the context of... Uh, of COVID and the fact that um, the Parliament and other institutions weren't meeting in the same way. We've seen a weakening, a fundamental weakening of the European Parliament. I think the European Parliament today is weaker than it was when I was a member of the European Parliament. I would say that's my estimation. Decisions are being taken in smaller and smaller circles. Um, if you look at decisions around the European Council, for example, Decisions are now being taken in very small circles around the president of the European Commission at a very high level, with even um, members of, uh, of the European Commission responsible for, for policy areas 
finding out announcements in the press conference after meetings rather than being involved in the policy making process. So this intense crisis is not good governance and good policy making. And one way that, and I think that has its limits and we need to kind of bring back um, the democratic scrutiny and democratic accountability to decision making at the same time as reinforcing and strengthening um, cooperation. Um, the solutions for the social crisis, that's like a, a whole um, other 25, 30 <laughs> minutes. I won't go into all of it. There are proposals, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it. But, but I think that fundamental thing of pulling together, strengthening the links, but making those links uh, democratically <laughs> transparent and, and accountable is really important um, yeah. if Europe is going to survive. First question, is it an important actor on the world stage? Yes, of course it is. If only because of our past, um, as, as member states, individual states have introduced different languages across the world, they've colonized across the world, they've picked up slaves and distributed them across the world. So we've, we've got a, a huge amount of passive history. And we remain important because as a trader, um, as a source of culture, um, as, a, as a, a, a group of diplomats, it remains important. But you will ask also, is it a positive influence? I'd say actually the very existence of the European Union, with all the difficulties to which Jude referred, is a positive influence. It is a unique example of countries seeking, with plenty of difficulties, but seeking to share their sovereignty. It's not an empire led by one country. Um, it's not simply a talking shop, as tragically uh, the United Nations tends to be. It's got teeth against its members to bring together collective policies. And that is unique in the world. So yes, I think it is a positive influence. Is it changing? Yes, and not all for the good. Enlargement is a real challenge. It was a cosy little group of Western European countries who could agree on things like unanimity of decisions among the five or six or nine. But when it comes to 27 very diverse countries, then we must move on beyond that. And the militarizing, you've referred to the problems that that raises. Can it change for the better? As a final point I would add. Yes, of course it can. And I, as I was thinking on the bus on the way here, when the future looks intolerable, it would be immoral not to imagine the improbable. And I think that that's what we've got to do. These changes that the European Union has to make, they're not going to be easy, but unless we can imagine them, they're just not going to happen. None of you actually mentioned in your presentation Poland or Hungary. And I'm glad you didn't in a way because disruptive tendencies are not confined to those two countries and it's not a good idea to scapegoat them. And it's a complicated issue, but can I put it to you as a question of power? How much power do nation states have to change the culture um, in ways that probably most people in this room would seriously disapprove of? And how much power does do the European institutions have to resist that kind of change? <coughs> we were able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and well, let me see. What, what is certain is that in some areas, uh, there is the need for unanimity, that the European Commission is sometimes quite pusillanimous, a little bit nervous about using the powers that it can exercise over those who misbehave. 
But it's tragic that if one needs unanimity to do certain things, then Poland can protect Hungary, Hungary can protect Poland, maybe Italy will defend France if there's a nasty change there, who knows. What I will add, though, is that my experience with the, cha the big changes in the European Union is that when it is confronted with a situation which is impossible, it changes. And I, I, I have great hope that confronted with the problem that we do have of the centre of gravity moving from it being a comfortable Western European club to being a much broader, the, the centre of gravity of Europe is somewhere east of Berlin. But, and we've got to recognise that. That can be an asset, but we need to change. And I, I believe that the European Union may find ways. I, I read my, my Piketty, I read my Varoufakis, and there, there are opportunities for making these jumps into an uncertain future. Over the European institutions, and in that sense, would be hard pressed, if you like, to get rid of, of their say or, or their blocking powers, as it were. But at the same time, we have to have a situation where, say, international law and this is just fundamental rights and so on have to be respected and upheld if you're in the union you're signed up to that that has to be the basic minimum that would be expected of people so i think some balance around that is if that's not coercive that's just well that's what you signed up to it is the law either suck it up or leave if you don't want to you know that that's not being out of order i think so how we get to that though i think is is yeah because I think there would be resistance on, on some things losing the, the unanimity in that, but there definitely does need to be something, and you're totally right about the, the balance shifting. I mean, it's completely different, and a lot of it has emerged now around the war that actually Poland and these countries now are actually in the in the pole position, as it were, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, on this issue, whereas they were more peripheral beforehand. So very interesting and challenging times for sure, but uh, whether they'll be able to deal with it, Maybe um, what's quite interesting, I think, as well, is that the impact of the war has meant that that the alliance that we saw in the European Council between Poland and Hungary has collapsed, um, and as a result, both countries are actually addressing some of the fundamental rule of law questions very quietly. Um, also, in order to access, uh, because the Commission where it does have a power, is to say, um, we will hold back the funds. And so in order that um, the, the budget is allocated, actually very quietly, some of the rule of law questions are being resolved in, in Hungary and Poland. I think the culture question is a really interesting one when you think about what will the European Union look like in six months' time with a Maloney government in Italy and the Swedish Democrats in Sweden. Because these are uh, more, uh, if, you have, if there is a, um, I, I, I think, this is my opinion, there is quite a condescending attitude in many of the European institutions towards the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the new member states, mm -hmm. even though they're not new member states anymore. Uh, they're the naughty children that need to pick up speed and get with the programme. But Italy and Sweden are core mm. traditional mm. European countries. So the impact of electing extremely right-wing governments in both cases is potentially challenges some of the culture in the European institutions in a different way than uh, Poland and Hungary did um, in the in the case of the rule of law, I would say, but the jury is out. Would you like to come back to any of the aspects? No, I maybe uh, on Ukraine because I um, so, um I was in the European Parliament in two thousand and fourteen when um the Donbas, the Crimean, the the Donbas uh, were invaded, and um what was what was very interesting. And I think this is just a, a little bit of my personal experience with Ukraine. And I've, I've been in Brussels uh, since um, 2000. And I've been around the trade union movement basically throughout that time. And then was elected in 2014. 
And as a, a before I was elected to the European Parliament, I was an elected trade union leader. And I remember in um, about 2000, 2000, no, 2010, 2011, going to the European Parliament to meet uh, one of the leading um, uh, German EPP MEPs from um, the, the German uh, CDU uh, at that time. They have a, a Christian worker branch inside the old traditional kind of Christian worker movement inside the Christian Democrats uh, party. And I met the leader of, of that group. He was on the board of the CDU. He walked through the door. He said, I can't believe that you've come to me to talk about this. You should be here as, as solidarity with Julia Timoshenko. Because at that time she was in prison um, in Ukraine. It was after the Orange Revolution. It was after the, what, what was very interesting in that single meeting was that because he was um, completely involved, this Elmer Brock, he was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the European mm -hmm. Parliament, he was completely in this discussion. He explained to us all of the ways within the EPP group of the European Parliament and within the uh, conservative family, political family, the links that they've been making into these revolutions, the Purple Revolution, the Orange Revolution, and so on. And, and that was quite an insight because from a trade union perspective, the trade unions in Ukraine and the trade unions in other countries were saying, we are being bombarded by pressure to reduce rights, to a, a neoliberal pressure which was coming mm -hmm. with this um, conservative alliance. There was an economic policy mm -hmm. being pushed at the same time. Not to, and that's maybe or often the case, there's a military dimension to this, but there was an economic agenda which was going towards the Ukraine as well, which fed you know, many of uh, the, the issues, uh, that's fed some some issues, I would say, um, through the time. What was interesting was that then in 2014, being elected as a new MEP, I felt completely out of my depth as an MEP, being told uh, we had to agree in the quickest time I've ever seen a free trade agreement with Ukraine because of the invasion of, of Crimea. We normally, a free trade agreement going through the European Parliament would take at the, the, the least one year. Process of scrutiny, uh, process of hearings, analysis of the text, and so on. We were given something like six weeks to agree the free trade agreement with Ukraine. And the day that um, we voted in Strasbourg, the screens, we voted live as the Ukrainian Parliament voted on the Ukraine FTA. And I was, I mean, I was quite a young MEP. I've, mm. I wasn't, I was responsible for trade policy for the Labour Party, but we weren't given enough time to scrutinise what this meant. There was massive liberalisation in this trade agreement in terms of all kinds of areas of Ukrainian society. But what shocked me the most was when the screens were came on from the Ukrainian parliament um, and we voted at the same time, the speeches that we heard in the Ukrainian parliament were really scary speeches in terms of the, the rhetoric which was used, the way um, that the, the agreement was being prepared and was being presented to the point that the European parliament turned off the live feed because MEPs were so concerned about what they were hearing at the same time. Now, we weren't given enough time, and we were, we were basically pushed to vote for this agreement because they said they, the Russia has invaded Ukraine, we have to take urgent measures, urgently need to show uh, solidarity uh, for the Ukrainians, and therefore, if you vote against this, you're voting with uh, Moscow. It was presented in a very, very pressured, um, way that really stayed with me as a, a terrible I mean it was a terrible insight in a way into other things which were going on but those partly it was also because that free trade agreement 
was actually in many parts opposed by parts of Ukrainian society, <coughs> but their voices were shut out as well in the debate. And what we're seeing now in the war um, in Ukraine is that under, if you like, under the cover of the war, the Ukrainian trade union movement are fighting for their most basic labor rights mm -hmm. because the Ukrainian uh, parliament has pushed through a whole raft of neoliberal legislation, labor market legislation, all um, in the context that we have to have crisis measures and we have to uh, be able to, uh, to take action. But taking away people's fundamental rights, their rights to be represented by a union, their rights to a basic standard of workplace safety, basic labor rights, this in this context is that we've become a very black and white debate about the situation in Ukraine. Um, and um, and the si I don't believe in black and white. I think we're always in shades of grey. And there are shades of grey in this situation as well. That is not to say that we don't show absolute solidarity sure. with Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. I'm not suggesting, in fact, in the trade union movement, the uh, Russian union, trade unions, which have um, endorsed or supported the, um, the war in Ukraine, have been expelled from the international trade union movement. Those that were, some of them left before they were expelled and those that hadn't left <coughs> were expelled. And actually in two weeks time, the European uh, trade union movement will um, extend to the trade unions of Ukraine. We are doing, everything that we can to support working people in Ukraine. But I would just, I think we always have to be aware of these nuances of grey mm -hmm. and to actually dig a bit deeper and understand what's going on because there are politics also at play in Ukraine. There are economic interests also at play in Ukraine, which are not necessarily um, in favour of the, uh, the wishes of Ukrainian <coughs> people. Uh, for their, the future of their country, but things happen in wars. I mean, it was really interesting to discuss a lot of food for the upcoming three days. Some of the key takeaway, at least my key takeaway, is that uh, we have to recognize the, the instruments we do have and that we still can work within the, those instruments to, to change the direction of the EU, um, but also look at ourselves critically. And I think it's my personal belief that it's much easier to do and look at yourselves critically in community. I mean, we're also creating a space here where we, we're mirroring or piloting the kind of uh, changes we want to see in the world. And healthy debate is really not easy, uh, but it is necessary. And clumsily, this is our way to create a better utopia. And I hope uh, it was a productive conversation for uh, the audience as well as for the speakers. Thank you so much. Amazing.